So a lot of you may be aware that the online portal has been undergoing some changes in its color, appearance and in the way that it tolerates users and information. You know, the same kind of changes that we undergo at Puberty. So let's take a look at the new upgraded portal and see what's changed. We'll talk about who creates the account in the new portal, which class do you select, the digital and the PDF form section and their signatures, document categories and their upload limit, fees, who pays and where, and finally, what happens when you submit the application. All right, so this is the PR portal page for applicants, also known as the client facing portal. This is where the applicant, meaning the person who is being sponsored, the person applying for permanent residence, should create the account using their own email address and then they should submit the application through their account. Even if the principal applicant is using their sponsor as a representative, they should still create the account using their own email address, meaning principal applicant's own email address. And if you're using a paid representative, meaning a licensed professional, an authorized agent, then they will probably be managing your application through this portal. This is also a permanent residence portal, but this one is meant for representatives. So you're not gonna have access to this one. And if you're using a paid representative, then your paid representative is going to be managing your application through this portal, okay? So for more clarity on who should create the account in all of these scenarios when using a representative versus not, you should check out this video where I've explained that in detail. It's linked in the description below. All right, so assume that the principal applicant has created their account and now the principal applicant has signed in using their own email address. So this is how your PR portal is going to look. So if you scroll down here, you're simply going to click on start new application because this is the first time you're accessing this portal. And now this is where you'll select your program. So this is family. Then you'll have to select the category. So we are talking about spousal sponsorship. So you'll select spouse. Then you will have an option to select the class. So if you are inside Canada, meaning the principal applicant is inside Canada living with their sponsor, you will have two options. You can either choose to apply under the spouse or common law partner in Canada class or you can also apply under the family class. If you are outside Canada, meaning the principal applicant is outside of Canada, then you will only have one option, family class. So let's just assume for the purpose of this video that the principal applicant is outside of Canada, so we'll select family class. And keep in mind, it's very important to select the right class when you are doing your application. A lot of applicants actually get their applications rejected because they apply under the wrong class. So make sure that you are applying under the right class. I've explained this in much more detail in this video, which is also linked in the description below. So once you've made the selection, you simply name the application. I would always go with the principal applicant's first name, last name, and then simply PR application. Just keep it simple. And then you hit continue. So once you sign in, this is how your application page is going to look. And if you scroll down, the first thing you'll notice is that the portal page is now divided into various categories and sections making it easier to navigate. So let's skim through this page real quick and get a general sense of each of these sections. All right, so the first section is digital forms. This section is for the principal applicant, meaning the person who's applying for permanent residence, not the sponsor. And while there may be some sections where sponsors information might be required, but the primary focus is on filling out this information about the principal applicant. And as the name suggests, these forms are digital, meaning there is no PDF, no barcode. They have to be filled right here inside the online portal. So to fill them out, simply click start and you'll be given a form. Start filling out the information using your computer right there. So a lot of people often get confused about the signature requirements for these digital forms. So you need to understand that for these forms, 0008, 5406, and 5562, there is no section for digital signatures. You provide your digital signature for these three forms, not inside these three forms, but when you give your consent for the application. So remember all the way down, there is a section for consent and declaration. This is where the principal applicant types their full name as per their passport. And that also takes care of the signature requirements for these three forms, 0008, 5406, and 5562. They may add a digital signature box down the line, at which point you will obviously have to sign. But for now, as of February 2023, there is no signature section inside these digital forms, okay? However, 
This form 5669, which is Schedule A, does have a consent and declaration section inside. And you guessed it, the principal applicant has to type their full name exactly as per their passport in that consent and declaration section also. So keep in mind, two consent and declaration sections in your application, one for 5669 and one towards the end of your application just before submitting, all right? All right, so these forms 0008, 5406 and 5669, these are mandatory, which means they have to be filled out by the principal applicant, no exception. Doesn't matter where you're from, doesn't matter what your situation is. But this form 5562 is actually a country specific form, only required to be filled out by applicants from certain countries. So notice how for 0008, 5406, 5669, it says mandatory in parentheses. But for 5562, it doesn't say mandatory. But this required keyword, which is common for all these four forms, is what is causing the confusion. So applicants are confused whether they need to fill 5562 or not. So we'll get to that in a second. But the first thing for you to do is to find out whether this 5562 is applicable for you or not. So how do you find that? Let's get to this page. This is your guide 5289. This is your official guide for spousal sponsorship. Always start with this. This is your most important document. I have learned to say this in one breath. That's how important this is. So now if you scroll down, click on step three, complete the application, scroll down even further, you'll get to this section, document checklist and country specific requirements. This is where you find any other documents and forms which are specific for the country of residence of the principal applicant. Let's select this spouse here because we are talking about spousal sponsorship. And then here we'll work with two different examples. So let's select India first and then India again. And then if I click on get checklist and forms, if you scroll down, as you can see, under country specific requirements, 5562 shows up, which means that this form is required for applicants from India. So in this case, the applicant who's living in India at this point, outland applicant, has to fill out 5562, no questions asked, because this showed up in their country specific requirements. But let's change the country and let's assume that the principal applicant is currently living in United States of America and then just select United States of America again. And if I press get checklist and forms, as you can see, most of the documents are the same, but if you scroll down, there is no 5562 that shows up here. So this means that applicants who are currently residing in the United States don't really need to submit 5562. So these kinds of of applicants get confused because their country specific package is clearly telling them that there's no 5562 required but the online portal shows this as required and there's no mandatory keyword listed here and that is what causes the confusion so i believe that this is an error on their part because they didn't really fix this when they were updating the portal and they might fix this soon so what might happen is that instead of required they might change this to if applicable and that would be a much better representation of 5562. So until they fix this, you have two options. Number one, you can just skip this section if it doesn't apply to you. But if you don't feel safe about this because they've clearly listed it as required, and even if it doesn't apply to you, you still feel that it might hurt your application, I totally understand your concern. They have not really made it clear. So it's only logical for people to get concerned. In that case, even if it doesn't apply to you, I would even go so far as to click on start and just fill this out just to be safe. It's better to be safe than sorry, right? So it's not really going to harm your application if you fill this out, even if it's not mandatory. Just for additional support, what you can do is get a Word document and write a very small note that you know that 5562 doesn't apply to you because it didn't show up in your country specific package but you filled it out anyway for the principal applicant because you were confused about this required keyword. The more people that let IRCC know that this is causing confusion, the higher the chances that they will fix it soon. All right, so next up is PDF forms. As the instructions state, you must download, complete, digitally sign and upload them back to this portal under your application. So for spousal sponsorship, there are three PDF forms which are mandatory, 1344, 5532 and 5533. So in order to download these, you simply click this download option or you can also go to the guide 5289 to get the latest version. Then you'll most likely get a page like this. So it's okay, you just click on this save icon and then save this to your desktop and then you go back to your desktop and open it directly from your desktop. 
or downloads folder. That's how you open these forms. Okay. Another thing to note is that these forms require information from both the principal applicant and the sponsor. This doesn't mean that you download multiple copies of these forms. What it means is that you download a single form. So single 1344, single 5532 and single 5533. And you simply fill out information for both the principal applicant and the sponsor at the required specific sections in those forms. So let's quickly skim through this. This is 1344, scroll down all the way to the signature section. So this first line here is where the sponsor types their full name exactly as per their passport to complete their digital signature. And this form will allow you to type your full name using your keyboard. In the same form, third line, principal applicant does the same thing, types their full name exactly as per the passport using their keyboard. For spousal sponsorship, you leave this middle line blank. Okay, don't worry about this. Once the signatures are done, just select the dates, make sure the entire form is complete, then hit validate, and then you'll have barcodes. Then you can simply come back to the online portal and upload your signed 1344 here. Next up for 5532, there are four sections for signature, two for principal applicant and two for the sponsor. This form at this point does not allow you to type using your keyboard. So what you can do in this case is if you're using a Windows PC, then you can simply save this as PDF using the print to PDF function. Then select the tools icon, go to fill and sign, and then you will be able to digitally sign this. If you're using a Mac, then this print to PDF will not work. In that case, you can use a Mozilla Firefox browser to open this form. And in that browser, these signature boxes are going to be enabled. Then 5533 document checklist doesn't really need any signature. You simply check the boxes that apply to you and upload it right here in the online portal. Then if you scroll down and come to this additional application forms, you'll see a lot of forms listed here. So don't panic. These are not really going to apply to spouse's sponsorship. If you are using a representative though, whether a paid representative or your sponsor as your representative, then you will have to provide a use of a representative form, which is 5476. Simply download this and then the principal applicant fills this out, signs it, gets their representative to sign it also, and then uploads it again in the online portal. So if the sponsor is acting as a representative, then sponsor signs here, sponsor signs here because they are the spouse and here the applicant signs. If you're hiring a paid representative, then obviously the paid representative signs here, the applicant signs here, and the sponsor signs here, okay? And by the way, I've created a similar table for spousal sponsorship forms, which I've been sharing in other videos, which you see on the screen right here. Basically, this is just a summarized version of everything that we went through. Whenever there's an update regarding anything in the spousal sponsorship process, I add that information in this page. All right, so as you can see, the supporting documents section has received a fair bit of upgrade in the way it's structured. So now there's two sections, one for the primary documents and then additional supporting documents. But there's another update, each category, whether it's in the primary documents section or the supporting documents section, only allows 10 files per category. So for example, photos category, if you try to upload, it will only allow you to upload 10 files. If you try to upload the 11th file, it's gonna fail on you, at least as of now. They might fix this down the line. So for example, you have 20 photos to upload and you are trying to upload 20 individual photos, you're not going to be able to upload them in the photos category right here. So what you'll have to do is maybe upload 10 here and then upload another 10 in the other category. So keep in mind that this is your primary document section and each of these categories is required, meaning you have to upload required documents in each of these categories. Otherwise, the online portal might not allow you to submit. Then for all your additional documents, this is where you upload those in their respective categories. Now, a lot of applicants wonder which category is for the sponsor and which category is for the principal applicant. For example, this proof of status that you see here, this is for the sponsor because they need to know that the sponsor who's sponsoring the spouse is either a PR or a citizen. Only then they are eligible to sponsor. So that's just an example, but how do you know for sure? So again, go back to your document checklist, page four. Here is the section for supporting documents required. As you can see, there are two sections supporting documents for sponsor, which will give you all the documents required for the sponsor. And then there is a section for supporting documents for the sponsored person, meaning the principal applicant. And this will give you all the documents required for the principal applicant. So just as an example, birth certificate. So now you may wonder whose birth certificate you need to submit. It's the principal applicant. How do you know that? Go back to your document checklist, supporting documents for sponsored person, principal applicant. 
Under identity documents, travel documents and passports, if you scroll down, birth certificates are listed here. Same thing for police clearance. Police certificate is listed under the supporting documents for the principal applicant. And that's why you have to upload the principal applicant's police clearance certificate. Then if you scroll down even further, there is a section for proof of relationship. You guessed it, this section is pretty much common to both. In the online portal, there is a proof of relationship to sponsors section. So just select that section and whatever documents apply to your unique case, just upload them in this section, making sure that they are 10 or less documents. If not, you can just combine them. So the idea is to go through the document checklist carefully, understand the documents required for both the principal applicant and the sponsor, and then provide those documents here. Make sure to upload everything in the required category, and then all your supporting documents, whatever is required for your case in these respective categories. And for this additional documents section, if you can't really find a category to upload the document under, but that document is required for your case, then you can simply upload that document in the other category. It's not a big deal. All right, so once done with the supporting documents, you come down here, this is where you pay your fee. So to pay your fee, this is the link that they've provided. Simply click this link and it's going to take you to a page. Scroll down here. This is where you answer a few questions to get to your right amount of fees. And then based on your selections, you will be given an amount here. Then you sign in with your MyCIC account or your GCK account. If you don't have one, then register and then sign in. Click on confirm payment. It's gonna take you to a payment portal gateway. Simply enter your card details and make the payment. And it doesn't matter who makes the payment. The sponsor can make the payment, the principal applicant, a family friend or relative. As long as you make the full amount, you'll get a receipt in the email that you used to sign in. Download that receipt and simply upload it right here in the fee payment section. Then scroll down. Here's the last section, consent and declaration. So the principal applicant should type their full name in the consent and declaration section exactly as per their passport to complete the declaration. And then once you complete all the sections, assuming that you haven't left anything that was mandatory and you've provided all the required documents, then this button is going to turn green or blue or whatever color, basically it's going to be enabled and then you can submit your application. So once you submit your application, then you will receive a confirmation email, which basically tells you that your application has been submitted. And sometimes you receive it almost immediately. Sometimes it can take a day or two. That email is not your AOR. It's simply a confirmation that your application was successfully submitted. Then this is how your online portal is going to look. So as you can see, this is the application. It was submitted on this date and the submitted button with this purple color is going to show up like that. And the view button is going to be disabled. And this is normal. It happens for everyone. So once you submit your application through this portal, you are not going to be able to view your application. Any subsequent updates such as AOR, Biometrics Medical, you will be notified via email. They will only open this portal up for you if they were to reject or return your application, as you can see on the screen here, because our first application was rejected. So now you can go inside this application, fix the mistakes, and then resubmit through the return page. But just don't worry too much about this view button. Any updates to your application, you'll be able to track using the PR tracker once you receive AOR biometrics and medical. To learn about tracking, here's a video which you can watch once you get to that stage. You don't have to watch it right now.